My name is Emmanuel Charpentier. I am a macrobiologist and my laboratory is located in Berlin, Mitte. Professor Charpentier, could you tell me a little bit about your formative years, your, who was influencing you? I was certainly influenced by my parents in, in the fact that they were extremely energetic, extremely curious, extremely interested by life in general. So in my research, uh, already I started my laboratory with different thematics, maybe too many thematics, but in a way this has helped me focusing on one topic and, and choosing the topic that would have uh, the best uh, impact. So I have a lot of plans. I maybe think that I'm going to be immortal. <laughs> After your PhD, you were in America, in Vienna, Sweden, Hanover, and now Berlin. How is it to live a nomad life? To have the chance, really, to work with uh, different scientists, to have the chance to, to learn about the culture. It helps refresh my mind and, and this also, in a way, allows to fulfill my need of being free and not too much be put in a box. Uh, this idea to be put in a box is a uh, it's something that I find uh, very, um, very scary. Your life changed a couple of years ago since you and Jennifer Dudner discovered the CRISPR-Cas9. Could you explain maybe in words that a non-scientist would understand what does it really mean? CRISPR-Cas9 compared to the technologies that were existing before provides uh, the possibility to add uh, simplicity and to the, the way uh, one modifies uh, the DNA, develop um, models of diseases that are important to validate um, medicine under development. And in the agriculture field, the, the possibility to produce plant crops uh, that are produced in, uh, in a more precise fashion there's a lot larger uh, implications. That's a positive way you described and you, the negative way would be that you can now manipulate the DNA to create new humans. Yeah. <laughs> I certainly worry about the unwanted applications of the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. One cannot predict how far this technology will be applied to produce designer babies. And it is very difficult to control because there are maybe some countries which will uh, allow uh, the production of designer babies and that is also one concern. I think you had to overcome a lot of hurdles in your science life. Mm -hmm. I have additional hurdles because I am a woman and because I'm a foreigner. <laughs> And I discovered it more, this, uh, for sure, the female aspects when I became uh, a group leader at the University of Vienna and when uh, I realized actually that there were these types of grants uh, specifically to potentially promote the career of, of female scientists. So I boycotted all those grants because I understood that this was actually to bring the, the female scientists in, in a kind of path uh, that will be a parallel path uh, not specifically leading uh, to uh, success of a, of a career. So I understood it very fast and I said that I was abs absolutely not interested in applying for those types of, of funding. I wanted just to uh, have my grant applications uh, in the pool of, of applications of female and male scientists. So I have really a lot of difficulties with positive discrimination. And also you mentioned that the women have to fight more. What I want to say by this is that it does not promote women who would like to be able to focus on their career because it's very difficult to handle uh, everything together when the system does not offer more flexibility uh, with regard to, uh, you know, hours of So of, the system of has, the system should change? I think so. If young people consider, should I study science or not? What kind of mindset should somebody have? 
whether one wants to be a scientist or not, I think the most important in life is knowing yourself in principle, knowing your limits, and be open to be able to detect, um, let's say, when there are opportunities to be taken and live fully, in principle, life. <laughs>